So while he's waiting for the queue, if there's there's handouts, maybe we'll leave the rest of the handouts somewhere by the door or something, so when people arrive, they can they can take. There's a bunch on chairs. Okay, so welcome everyone, and uh, so this create session is as it's titled. There, we're going to be looking at Shakespeare in the early years, or let's say Shakespeare in the elementary ages with the elementary um, grades. So how the presentation is going to go forward is that we're going to have a few small interactive activities which you can participate in or not participate in. So it's, it's completely um, uh, voluntary. And, uh, but just so that you know, we're trying to intersperse what we're doing, showing what we're doing, because it's a very, the project that we're talking about is very much a, a, a practice-oriented project. So I'm George Beliveau. I'm a faculty member here in the, uh, at UBC in education, in language and literacy education. And Graham Lee is a PhD student in language and literacy education and has been working on this project with me for the past four or five years at least yeah. as a master's student as well. And Sue Beliveau is uh, one of the teachers in the, uh, in, in, as part of the study and has been really the, the longest participant in the study of probably we're at about over the years six to eight teachers have participated by doing different different parts of this project so Sue is here to answer some questions at the end and also facilitate a little bit of, uh, of what's happening hello Rita so the, the the presentation will will take we're looking at about 50 minutes or so and with with some interactive pieces so it's a pedagogical presentation but at the same time it's part of a research project so we're trying to keep it somewhat informal um, and, and recognizing that, um, that this is about teacher education and it's about looking at a particular case study. So there we have it. So I'm going to leave it to Graham. Graham's going to lead you to the, to the first small, small activity as, as a few people might be coming in. And this is um, both an activity that was done in the, in the classroom and, as George just mentioned, a way to bridge those that may come in in the next few minutes. Most of you have your um, outline of the presentation there, and everyone has it on the text side. Flip that over. What do we have? A novel. A uh, what? We have a face. There comes the first activity. Oh, there doesn't come the first activity. Come on, there there we are. Thank you. This is actually um, taken from the classroom. This is an example of what some of the students uh, did with this activity. And I'll just wait until. No, you're going to put your hand there. Get everyone's attention. I use the teacher face. <laughs> it, uh, I was always terrified of my father doing that teacher face. <laughs> it does. So I think just about everybody has um, something to draw with, and the last few are getting some some last few drawing utensils. These are some masks that were done in uh, one of the class, uh, classes. They were doing Much Ado About Nothing uh, in this particular year. And all of the students had to, as a pre-activity, they were given a little bit of a description about the character and then had to create a mask um, based on that. Now we're going to do a very similar activity here in this class. I'm going to give you some characters from A Midsummer Night's Dream, a little bit of a description, and I want you to Create a character out of one of them, and you can pick any one of the eight, I think, that we have on the screen, whether it's Oberon or Titania, Puck, Bottom, Flute, Lysander, Hermia, or Theseus. Look at the description and see, hmm, what might I come up with as a way of representing what little I know of this character, whether it's Bottom who becomes a donkey, so maybe that's going to shape the, the, his, his face. 
as you are drawing a uh, bottom. The flute becomes um, the heroine in a play, so maybe that will shape some of the features that you use or Queen of the Fairies. So we'll give you a few minutes to see what you can come up with. And don't worry, you won't be marked on any of your artistic ability. I just draw stick figures. So with whatever you are able to, just find a way of engaging with that. So as you are madly finishing up your face, this activity is actually, I'll do a bit of a book sale here. Uh, English in middle and secondary classrooms, creative and critical advice from Canada's teacher educators. Uh, edited by um, some of the faculty from the Department of Language and Literacy Education, and has a number of um, contributions from UBC faculty, including a chapter uh, based on this. And I actually first encountered this activity 10 years ago in my first English methods class when I did my BED, instructed by uh, George. And I will let him continue on from there. Okay, so th this initiating activity is, um, is used by the teachers in the, in the project that we're going to be talking about. It's a way of introducing the characters of a Shakespearean play, but it's also a way of introducing characters, if you're doing a, a Dickens novel or something where there's a number of characters, how do you start putting the character names in your mouths using an arts-based approach? So as Graham mentioned in that chapter, in that book actually, we, we detail, I detail how that process can happen, and it's been used with a number of in, in pre-service uh, or teacher, teacher education classes. So tying in this, so we'll, we'll move on to the, to the next slide. So the, the, the general context of why Shakespeare? And then also, why Shakespeare with children? Well, this project is akin to the Royal Shakespeare Company out of, out of the UK has been doing a fairly extensive study on looking at introducing Shakespeare to young children, as young as four and five years old. It's a fairly, it's a longitudinal study. They've been looking at um, not only four to five year olds, but up to, to 10 to 12 year olds. And none of the, of course, these, uh, the conclusions or the, the findings are conclusive in any ways. But what we are finding in this project here in, in Canada and in British Columbia mainly, and what they've been founding, finding there is that, that, that children are inspired by the musicality of the language. They're inspired by the richness of the language of Shakespeare. And probably more so than anything else, Shakespeare is at the center, or has been named in the Western canon, at the center of literature for, for many reasons, because of the compelling stories. He's been able, through his work, to capture human nature in ways that perhaps not all other authors have been able to capture. So this notion of, of, uh, of human nature, of, of, uh, of character, of struggles, of identity, is something that can be reached from the, the early ages until the to more senior ages. And um, so those are some of the, re the, the grand, grand reasons of why Shakespeare. And I won't get into detail about some of, the, uh, some of our findings, but just as a glimpse, second language learners in, in the Lower Mainland, for instance, are, are, uh, are, are part of our school population. And what we have found is that the, the, they're not disadvantaged in, in, in working with Shakespeare. Um, some of these students are, are constantly um, encountered with uh, decoding language. So when it comes to Shakespeare, there, there's not this, this necessarily this fear of Shakespeare because they're, in their heads they're, they're thinking, well, I, I can try to figure this out this way, and they've, they've developed certain mechanisms. So whereas in, in the school where, where Sue is uh, working at currently, um, we, we have at least a 50% population of second language learners, and even though this project is taking place there, we haven't disadvantaged students. Because that's usually one of the concerns. Well, if you're already doing Shakespeare with um, students that are just learning the language, what happens? Well, we've found that, it, in fact, it's an equalizer in some ways. So the, the stories are compelling in Shakespeare. The cultural literacy of Shakespeare is, is one of the other reasons that we're, we're finding that, um, that, that is a, a pro to some of this, this kind of work. So I'm going to begin with, with, a, with a quotation of, uh, of a parent of why, because this study took place, we interviewed parents, we've interviewed teachers, we have um, reams of data from, from uh, from some of the students in terms of writing, um, illustrations, etc., which I will talk to a little bit later on. But this is one quotation from one parent. And to the question, why Shakespeare? If I had to choose one reason why Shakespeare was valuable for my seven-year-old daughter, 
I think I would say the worldliness she gained by learning Shakespeare. Why learn about Columbus? Why learn about the Black Plague? Why know a Beatles song when, uh, when you hear it? You should just know these things. Because even if you don't care about them directly, they affect the world around you. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to now move on to three, th three phases. And before we move on to the three phases, we're going to look at the literacy component of literacy-based activities of, of doing Shakespeare as initiating activities. And then we move to drama-based activities, and then we move to more production-oriented. So we're, before we talk about the literacy-based ones, we'll give you a bit of a sense of the context of where this study took place. So we were in Cedar Springs Elementary School, which is, um, maybe bring these all up sure. here, uh, school here in, um, in Vancouver, um, Montessori classes, and they focused mostly on six to nine, most years of this project, but then uh, um, ages uh, six to nine, but then also uh, there was one year where it was um, nine to 11 year olds very multicultural student population um, in, a, in a relatively affluent part of, uh, part of the city. Yes, there is. And just the dates. Um, George beat me to it. From 2007 to uh, this past year, 2012, this um, study has been going on. And we're going to bring a number of artifacts actually in that we have worked with in the class. And the first comes from Lois Burdett. Um, who has? Yeah, so the, the literacy-based activities begin, we're, we're kind of scaffolding some of the activities with, with the teachers. And Sue, feel free to jump in. She's been doing this for the last six years, and we're talking about what her and her colleagues are doing. Um, but the, the literacy-based activities begin by sharing the story. And uh, Lois Burdett, who is from Stratford, Ontario, who was a primary teacher herself for a number of years, introduced and created these books with her children. And I'll, I'll uh, circulate them around, but you'll see that it's the Shakespeare story written in, in a narrative, poetic style. Not necessarily Shakespeare's language in full, but does integrate Shakespeare's uh, language. But it's filled with images um, created by the children and some writing by the children. So this is the first introduction to the Shakespeare plays that, um, that, that the teachers use. So I'll circulate these around. Did you want to say so something? You, I wouldn't read the whole thing at once. They're about 60 pages or so. I always break it up into chunks because it's a pretty rich, dense story, um, all of them. And so they can, they can only handle, I can only handle four to six pages at a time. But there's lots of things that happen while the four to six pages are going on. I guess, first of all, they would listen to it. But before that, so I'll just back up. First of all, we would do a vocabulary conversation. So if there's a bunch of words in there that I know that they're not necessarily aware of, we'll talk about what they, what do these words mean? And not necessarily in the context of the story, but often, often based on the context of the story, I know what the word is meant it, to mean in the story, and so I help them draw, I draw, try to draw that out of them. So we'd start with a vocabulary, and then I'd have them listen to the pages of the story and then refer to, when we come across one of those words, refer to that word, oh, there's that word. What does it mean again? That kind of thing. So that, that sort of, they're always listening for that, for that word, and, and they get actually fairly excited about hearing it. So we can look inside even the book, the um, inside, this is inside the Lois Burdett um, story, so you can, as it's circulating around, you can see the images that are drawn from the children the setting of the play, this particular play being set in, this is uh, Padua, um, Italy. So is that, is this much ado about nothing? It's Messina. It's Messina. Okay, so they're on the island of Sicily. So Sue has alluded to some of the, the word walls, which we'll talk about later on. And, and on your handout as well, I refer to an article. This is a, a recently published article about this, about this work, about a case study. And it, it does articulate some of these literacy-based strategies and um, in, in more detail. So one of them, the, the word wall that Sue is referring to, yeah, as you can see there in the classroom, this is, this is used by her and some of the other teachers as well. It then becomes integrated across the curriculum as well. So it's not just about the Shakespeare play. It becomes part of their spelling. It becomes part of their sentence creation in a Montessori way as well. This, uh, the circle is... 
the, the grammar symbols, yeah. So you have the verb, the adjectives, the nouns, etc. as they're building their, um, their knowledge of sentence creation. So the Shakespeare is, is not only, it's not an aside, it's part of the curriculum. So that's one of the, um, the, uh, the literacy approaches, the word wall. The next one is the, the, the masks as well, so that the character names and then the descriptions of the characters, the, the tendencies of the characters. So this is at, at, at this point that what we can do is just spend a couple of minutes as you share the artifact that you created, maybe in, in groups of three or four of where you're, you're comfortable to share what you created with your masks. And some of the, some of the, the icons or the symbols, symbols that you might have used to try to represent what was written on the, um, on the screen in terms of representing the character. So if you don't mind turning to the small, small groups, let's say three or four maximum, let's talk about how you create your particular mask. Okay. 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 Just one second. Okay, as you're discussing in your groups, the whole pedagogic approach of, of, of this, as I've mentioned, it's actually detailed quite a bit in that book in terms of how can we engage with the mask activity. But as I was observing you, many of you were looking up at the, because Graham had put the, the names of the characters, the idea is that there's a, a sense of repetition that they keep looking up at the, at the screen or if it's on a, a piece of of uh, sheet paper on, on, the, uh, on the wall is that they're keep, they, they go, okay, is that Lysander or is that Puck, is that Bottom? All of a sudden the, the character names become in their mouths and they start seeing what are some of the tendencies of these particular characters, the, the, the lovers in terms of they're going to be under a spell. Now remember, they really at this point haven't been introduced to the story or they've just been gradually introduced to the story. Depends. What we're talking about, there's no... Um, that things are happening sometimes simultaneously. The, the, the story could be read while they're doing, doing the masks and the word wall is happening. So a lot of things are happening concurrently. But the, the notion of that activity is really that we keep looking up at the wall and trying to get the character names in their mouths. Because that's one of the biggest fears of Shakespeare is this that you look at the dramatist personae. I remember even as a university student and looking at, let's say, uh, uh, Julius Caesar and looking at all these characters how am I going to figure out who is who? And then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're fearing a story before you even started. So this is one of the ways of, of, of breaking it down and also being playful with it. And that's the whole idea, especially a play like A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is about trickery and play and, and imagination. 
So, and as he, as George said, if the masks can be done with them knowing nothing about the characters, just those little lines. Um, I've done it both ways where they know nothing, just a little tiny description, and sort of th two thirds of the way in where they know a little bit more. And the quality is really a tiny bit different, but um, but either way works just as well. And it becomes an artifact throughout the whole process because we, we put these. The, the teachers put them up in the classroom, and then there's a, there's a recollection of the characters of the play. So we talked about literacy-based activities, the word wall. We talked about the masks. Some of the other literacy-based ones that are used are the, the leaves and the butterflies, and et cetera. And this is where research and pedagogy start becoming one, is that the children write journals as well, reflection journals. Sue and her colleagues would, would ask them to... to to journal about what did you think about the misunderstanding between uh, at the very beginning of the play. Let's say Aegeus does not want his daughter to marry, um, is it Lysander? He doesn't want her to marry. It's one of the two lovers. Yeah. It's determined that his daughter cannot marry Lysander. And so the, the, the children might journal a little bit about this misunderstanding and about, about parents or whatever they know at the stage that they're at. The other way, so they'll, they'll journal about that. But the other way that we also have asked them to do is to make it a little bit more fun is that um, they cut out flowers, they cut out leaves, they cut out butterflies. And in, on those cutouts, through some prompt questions, they respond to them on these questions. So if they've encountered, they did an activity, um, they might even respond in, uh, on, I enjoy doing the activity where we were up here. You can actually see, I'm excited about the play. Well, see, now remember, these are some of them are six-year-olds or eight or seven-year-olds, and then I like learning my lines and reading them out loud. So this is later on in the process when they start rehearsing these particular examples. Strategically, for research, these became, of course, data sources for us as, as we we had hundreds of these. But also theatrically, what these became, they became the set for a Midsummer Night's Dream, or when we did the Tempest, they became the set for the Tempest in the forest with all these, uh, these artifacts. So artistically, the classroom was being created in a Montessori way or in a Reggio Emilia approach as well. So, but it's a literacy-based approach that they're reading and writing. The, I think there's one final, two final ones, if you can move to the next slide. What the, the children at the very end, in terms of assessment, my arts-based class, we're talking about assessment, is when we do this kind of work, okay, well, so how do we, how do we give them feedback? Well, one of the pieces of feedback is that they write a letter at the end of the process in terms of what was their experience. So they share a letter to someone who didn't come and see the play. So in this case, I really wish you could have made uh, come to see the play. And so she talks about her experience, or he talks about his experience, to keep the children anonymous here, um, in terms of what was their experience, what do they remember from it. So it's a writing-based activity, but it's also a reflection on their experience. So that's one of them. And then the other, the other piece, which I'll circulate the newspaper, is that the, the children created a newspaper. In this case, with uh, Much Ado About Nothing, they created the Messina Times. Much Ado About Nothing takes place in Messina. And this newspaper is rich and filled with synopsises of the, the particular play, but written in a newspaper fashion, headlines, such as, um, do we have headlines that you can see? Claudio, a brave soldier, falls for governor's daughter. Right. Don Pedro's plan. So all the, the different elements of the plot are also, but they're written by the children. And also the weather in terms of what, what is happening, the crossword puzzles in them, the word wall appears in this, this, uh, this literacy-based activity. But it's very creative, and uh, of course, w without the assistance, sometimes it's, it's almost, uh, the teacher does need help from either parents or from graduate students who are working on a project to help put these things together in a realistic way. Yeah, that but was, that was an exceptional work. Yeah. However, the, the children, then it becomes the program. If someone can flip the back of it, the program for the parents, the character names are, are, are listed on the back, so then they're handed out, and, and with, with great pride. So those are the literacy-based activities that, that, uh, that, that we talk about. We're going to move right into some of the more drama-based activities, starting to put... Um, the, the, getting the body involved in this. So we're going to show a tableau of a particular moment in A Midsummer Night's Dream. I've asked some, some volunteers from my class to come and share one of, the, one of the tableaus. So Graham is going to read this particular moment. So some of the literacy or some of the drama-based activities we do are tableaus, and I'll list a few more after that. So if I can ask my, uh, my 
four volunteers to come forward. So this will give you an example of a moving tableau. So this is sort of the um, tableau uh, step step one, two, or three. It's a, it's moving up the uh, the ladder of what a tableau looks like. So Graham, when you're ready. A play has been requested for Theseus and his bride. We haven't much time, Peter Quince cried. Their wedding is soon, so we'll have to act fast. Now listen, I read out the names of the cast. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Your role is to be a Pyramus, a lover, as you will soon see. A lover most gallant that kills himself for love. Nick was ecstatic. The role fit like a glove. Francis, F Francis Flute, you'll take Thisbe's role. I want you to give it your heart and your soul. Flute was excited, his eyes sparkled bright. What is Thisbe, he asked, a wandering knight? Oh no, Quince replied, Thisbe's a she, and madly in love with Pyramus, you see. Then Quince turned to Snug. In our tale of woe, you'll be the lion in our show. I'll need the script now, Snug said with concern. It will take me quite a while to learn, for I'm slow to, slow to study, I implore. Don't worry cried Quince. All you do is roar. <laughs> okay, so they're frozen there. Thank you. You can release your <laughs> tableaus. <laughs> so in this way, the, 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 the tableau work, or the, the drama-based work, is, is concurrently done with the literacy-based work. So they're doing some reading and writing, but they're exploring the story also through with body. So the, in, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, there are four worlds in particular. There are the lover's world, then there's the fairy's world, and then the, um, the, the court as well, the, the, the king and the queen, or the duke and the duchess, and then there's the mechanicals, the actors who are going to create a play. So here we get a sense of putting, putting some flesh behind some of these characters. Sue's going to lead you into a, a second tableau activity, and, and in this case we're just going to ask clusters of five, and we're not, going to sh we're not going to necessarily show these to anyone, but just so you have a sense of how do we put this um, into, into motion. So maybe I'll, I'll have this, this group of five, and by all means, if you want to pass on the activity, you can, you can pass, but I'll just put you into groups of five. So maybe I'll have the five of you here, and then I'll have the, the, the six of you there, that's fine. And then maybe the, the six of you behind there, and then this looks like we'll be one, two, three, four, five here. And uh, the, the two of you will we'll, we'll help us facilitate to go to other rooms in a second, other, other groups. So Sue is going to read a passage, just listen to it the first time and then we'll give you instructions for the second time. But just listen to this particular passage. Okay, so this one, this is midway, page 46, so midway through the, the, the text. So we've already done this many, many times. Um, okay, so it, the two words that I'm going to focus on right now are worship and mock, and I would have a conversation with them about what they thought they meant, knew, if, if they know what those words mean. And then we start the story. As Oberon and Puck quickly withdrew, Lysander and Helena rushed into view. Helena, cried Lysander, I worship you. You mock me, she yelled. I told you to go. And then Demetrius awoke. Oh, Helena divine, tell me you love me, give me a sign. And then both men dropped to their knees and cried, marry me, please. So, um, so uh, in, this, in this little tiny <laughs> snippet, there's a whole lot going on. There's, uh, Demetrius is asleep. Lysander is chasing Helena and saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oberon and Puck are sort of watching from, from behind a tree because they have placed the magic potion on Demetrius's eyes so that when he awakes, the first thing he sees, he falls in love with. Um, and I think that Helena, or anyways, it's a very complicated story, <laughs> but the, the kids actually can follow along quite well. So it, your job in your groups of five is to determine one of you will be Lysander, Demetrius, Helena, Oberon, and Puck, and create a tableau that will represent some aspect of the, the reading. And while you're getting organized, maybe I can read it again, and you can listen to it uh, one more time just to get a sense of how you might, because there's not only one way to do it where you dropped, two of them drop to their knees and are begging. Right. There's lots of different things that you can put into it. So um, I'll read it again, and you can quietly get up and move around and then think about at the same time. 
what's going on. Okay, so as Oberon and Puck quickly withdrew, Lysander and Helena rushed into view. Helena, cried Lysander, I worship you so. You mock me, she yelled. I told you to go. And then Demetrius awoke. Oh, Helena, divine, tell me you love me. Just give me a sign. And then both men dropped to their knees and cried together, Marry me, please. So you're just going to set up the, an image from those six lines. So one image from the whole thing that you can try to come up with. doing this, if we were doing this as part of a class, we would spend more time doing this and we would share them, the groups that would be comfortable sharing them. But in the spirit of also that when you ask people to do something and then they don't get a chance to do it, a little bit of it, what, what I'm going to ask is this, for instance, this group is just going to share their tableau with this group and then they'll show it to one another and it'll only take about 30 seconds. And then we have a group over there that can just share it with this group over there and we have a group over here that can just share it to this group. It's not, a, it's not about a public performance. All this work is all about the, uh, the exploration and the process. It's not about who is the better performer. Everything is about showing a process. So I really want to emphasize that. And, and so, but let's, in the spirit of at least sharing what we, what we, where we're at in that two minutes that you have to create it. So we'll ask these two groups. So in about, uh, and then maybe you'll go first, and then you'll, you'll share it. And then you'll, you'll share it first, and then... Seven, okay, so if we do that, then we'll move on. We can share ours first. Yeah. 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 We've mirrored it. <laughs> Snooze in the corner, that's all you have to do. Just act like it's real school. We ready? <laughs> 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 Yeah. I'm Lysander. I worship her. Yeah. And I'm taking all the glory with great disdain. <laughs> and Demetrius is just waking up. That's what we're going for. The end. Uh, the two 
lovers, and you're you're over on her puck, presumably watching over the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, or both. I saw both in there. I'm multifaceted this morning. <laughs> Okay, thank you for sharing it to one another and, and, and also for, for jumping into this work. We're talking about work that's very interactive. It's not, we're, we're talking about curriculum that, that is, uh, is not only from the neck up. We're talking about a curriculum of, of having children explore with their bodies. Taking risks, of course, it's not always comfortable as, as you are experiencing now. Do I really want to do this? Yeah. Of course, children are, are typically a little bit more free to do that, but... After grade three or four, as some of you have encountered in your placements, they also become a little more self-conscious. So how can we help them be as free with their body so that they can think through body as well as... as, as. Sue, Sue wanted to add something so, about the tablets. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add was that, that you only heard that twice. I might only allow them to hear it once. And there's no right answer. So the lovely part of doing a tableau is that they can be creative. And it, it, they, they at first are a little bit, but I don't know what to do. But then if you just give them time, they are able to come up with something. And you all did a brilliant job. Obviously, you have tons of experience with that. <laughs> Great. So some of the other drama-based activities that, that, that Sue and her colleagues explore in, in the classroom, so that was a tableau. There's a, there's a wonderful strategy called the hot seat, and maybe we'll do the hot seat at the very end, that if you have questions for Miss B, um, for, uh, that she can be on the hot seat. But hot seat is really where a character is put essentially on trial and people ask them questions. You'll see a glimpse of it later on in the presentation. Um, some of the other, uh, the other activities, role-playing, teacher in role, a whole bunch of strategies that are used drama-based so that there's an, an, an as-if world and an imagination that's taking place. So we've talked about literacy-based activity, drama-based activities, to explore the text, to get inside the text, to fall in love with the text, hopefully. But then the next stage is then the, the children are very excited about presenting this text and go as far as they can go through a rehearsal process towards a production. So we have this, this image in the production. The production is ranged in terms of time. Um, how long do they have? So uh, you can see a set behind here, the lighting. Um, in, in some years, I've been able to bring the lights that I have um, from my department to, to help out. Um, you don't see the plants necessarily here, but there's some, some uh, uh, parents bring in some plants to create that atmosphere of, of a Midsummer Night's Dream as well. And there you see the backdrop that, of course, they have created, they designed, and trying to emulate what, what it means to them. This is for Much Ado About Nothing, which takes place in, in Leonato's garden. Um, here, I, I want to also point out, uh, Sue played Leonardo in, in, her, in that particular production. And it was quite fitting, because the, the play takes place in Leonardo's garden. Very Montessori in the sense that uh, Montessori, usually, you, the, the teacher creates a classroom that's close to the home environment, invites the children into the classroom. And um, so this play worked fairly well because none of the children also wanted to play Leonardo because he was this old man that, described by Shakespeare. So um, that, that, also, that, that was also fitting. So the production goes from all the levels of how do you cast a play. So there's multi, multiple casting. So that the, the main characters, in this case, Beatrice, and um, Benedict might be played by two or three children. These, these are typical things that you encounter. But also when the classrooms are multi-age, they're grade one, grade two, grade three. So the grade threes, of course, there's a mentorship process happening as well. They typically take on the larger roles, but they've also had experience when they were grade twos to play other roles. Um, and then the grade ones typically play more, um, not in a stereotype way, but they'll play the, the, the fairies, for instance, in the Midsummer Night's Dream, so that they can feel comfortable with, um, with exploring. With exploring. This, is, th this image also shows this notion from page to stage, that they explore the text in literacy-based ways, and then they transfer or transmediate, let's say, to use a, another term, towards the, the production. So they take meaning from the literacy and bring it into a different form of literacy. And, um, and then you can see the costumes as well. So it gives you a bit of a flavor of, of how far can you go with it. Um, and uh, then the importance of the parents being there. So it's a play about community. And a lot of this, this work also, from a research perspective, I used to do a lot of anti-bullying work through drama. Well, this was my, another approach of how can you build community through drama so that when issues of tension, of misunderstandings happen, how can, how can drama 
work through this. And Shakespeare's plays are, again, a jewel for misunderstandings. Often it, it is a misunderstanding, and I'm not saying bullying is simplified as misunderstandings, but it's about power imbalances quite often. It's about uh, all, all these other things. But if you build this, this sense of community, what, what, what might happen? And um, we have found through the years that, that a community is being built not only with the children, but the parents as well, because they're pretty excited about their, their children being part of all this. Anyway, so here you have the, the, the cast again. So from, is there anything else that you want to add? And there's lots to talk about production-wise, but is there something in particular that you want to share before we move on? Okay, they do adapted scripts as well. So there's a, we have a version here. Uh, Richard Carter, who's from Lopez Island, which is one of the San Juan Islands, has adapted a number of the Shakespeare scripts. And these are the ones that the school has been using over the years. He's now adapted, I think, eight of Shakespeare's plays. So instead of having a two to three hour production, of course, which would be very um, almost impossible to do for, with, uh, with children that age, these are condensed to about 45 to well, 50 no, minutes. Well, no, those are 90 minutes. Richard's are 90 minutes. Some, are, some, some of yeah. them are 110. Some of them, anyways. So I've also gone through through the script and cut a bunch of stuff. Also, it, uh, it just you just need to with depending this, on the grade you have. With one two, with grade one two three, uh, it needs to be it needs to be trimmed even more, um, and it's a bit time consuming, but well worth it. And and Richard's been very generous in allowing us to cut his scripts. I've invite, he's been part of our Drama Institute a few summers as well, and he works with children basically 5 to 95 on Lopez Island, and they do productions of Shakespeare. So the production part of it, th this, so, so then what I want to talk about now briefly, and Graham will, will uh, jump in here as well, is all this pedagogy, all this sort of um, learning happening, how, how, do we, how do we do a bit of research about this? So we're going to give you a little bit of the snippet of some of the, the, the data collection. Oh, but before then, we have a little short two-minute video, and then we'll talk about the research. So this will take you inside the classroom. Okay, here we go. Remember, like I always do, I read the last page we read last time first this time. Help, uncle, uncle, help, she wailed. This is so unjust. What does unjust mean? This is so unjust. Sarah, what do you think? Unreal? Unright? Unbelievable? Unfair. So unfair, absolutely. Okay, so think about a question about, think about this what is we the hot seat for today. today. What are you going to ask Leonardo so we can further understand him? So that, that brings you inside of some of the, the, the work that we've been talking about as one example. And you could see some of the snippets uh, on the side. You could see the leaves that were on the wall. You can see the masks and uh, some of the activities we're talking about, how they all feed into this, this, this production. 
So in terms of data, maybe Grandma, I'll leave it to you to begin in terms of how, how, do, we, how do we create um, a research kind of agenda out of this? And well, as you saw just there, a big part of the, uh, at least the initial data set was the video that uh, you saw. Just have to remember what's coming up next. Um, the field notes. So I went in as, as a, a field re researcher and was taking field notes, George, who were um, all, uh, there were a number of other researchers who have been involved in this project uh, throughout its lifetime who've also been uh, kept an archive of field notes. Of course, there are photos and wherever that script um, went, yes. and went around. So that, that became actually part of the, the data set that was then built into uh, George's recent research paper here. So it's a, you know, a lot of material comes out of that class, whether it be the written sources that you saw, the word wall, the, the leaves, that I think a few of those have gone around. And I think a lot of it, at least for me, was the, the field notes and the experience of being in there and watching these kids do this and enjoy doing it and struggle with doing it and just um, engaging with, with Shakespeare. And some of the other da data that we pulled, we had interviews with the, with the parents as well. And then we did a focus group. After three years of the project, we, we brought in some of the children and um, talked about, now you've been doing this for three years, what are, some of the, um, what are some of the outcomes of this work? And of course, with children doing that kind of research, we didn't do it in, as an interview. We did it as a, as a drama process. So I had one of my graduate students facilitating a workshop. And as they were doing activities, we were sort of eliciting some of their comments and some of their feelings. And do you want to talk about one of, one of the findings during that, that workshop as well or during that, that focus group? Sure. So um, some of these children had worked on A Midsummer Night's Dream three years prior. And uh, one of the activities we gave them to do was the last monologue, I guess, by Puck. Is it That's Puck right, yep. that? The If We Shadows Have Offended monologue. We, had, as a class, had done it, um, ten lines of it, during the production three years ago, and it was something we worked on quite a, a lot, and we had all these actions to it, and we rehearsed it, I don't know, many, many times. That being said, we gave them that exact text to ha help warm up their memories about what they did three years ago, and they said to me, we don't need that. And I said, well, what do you mean? You did it three years ago. <laughs> you probably need a little bit. And they're like, no. And off they went with, if we shadows have offended, think with this and all And they knew all the actions. And it was mind-blowing. I, I couldn't believe that they had, had been able to not only perform it in front of their parents when they did it, but three years later bring it out of them and have no issues with the memory of it. And I mean, it, it, it speaks to that notion of when you put something in your body that there's, there's muscle memory and there's tons of research supporting that, but it becomes part of, part of who they are. So the, um, the, uh, the, the research is ongoing. We've, we've written probably about seven or eight different research articles about this work. Some of the work, some of you have uh, probably uh, either seen or witnessed. We've also taken a lot of this data and created some theater out of it and presented it internationally a lot of this work, um, which is another vein of the research that, that Graham and I and others are involved in. And that's a much more creative way of disseminating research. But it's been done in very traditional journal article ways as well. So in a way to um, wrap up this discussion and then open it up to conversation, the last speech that Sp Sue spoke about that uh, Puck uh, ends the play with If We Shadows Have Offended, Sue is just going to take a few minutes and uh, walk, you, walk you through that um, and there it is. So this is the way that she would explore it with her, her children. So, so bringing you, it back to practice. You actually research. have a hard copy on the back of your beautiful masks. The bottom six lines is that, the beginning of that speech. But you can also use this. It's up to you. One of the ways to, often children, they get real excited and they just read through the periods and the commas and to um, enlighten them to the importance of, a, of punctuation. Uh, one of the things I like to do with them is, well, we, I would read it to them once while they're holding the paper, and I would invite them to read with me if they wanted to. And I would make a conscious effort of pausing ex an extended amount at the periods and, and commas and colons and whatever, 
So I'll do that with you. If you want to join me, feel free. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding than a dream. Then I'd do that a couple of times, and then I'd say, okay, stand up. So you're welcome to stand up. Hold on to your sheet. And at every piece of punctuation, we're going to read and block, so just so you know, watch out for anything on the floor. At every piece of punctuation you come to, so the first one is a comma, um, we're going to turn. So it'll go like this. If we shadows have offended, think about this, and all is mended, and then turn. And it, it can be a, any degree of turn in a circle that you'd like to do. It depends, obviously, where, where you're going and what, who you might bump into. So be mindful that you're aware of the space as well. Um, so yeah, we'll do the same length of pause, be it a period, a, pun, uh, a comma, or, or anything else we might run into while you're reading. Okay, are you ready? And shift at every punctuation. And shift, yeah, okay. shift, or yeah, some slight, try to make it straight line and then a turn. All right. If we shadows have offended, think about this. That you have slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this sweet and idle no more you And we might do that a few times. Um, I might do it where uh, I'd have a few of them, volunteers who would like to do it. It's something that they could work on when they're rehearsing their lines around their house, trying to figure out how to say their lines at home. It would be something I would instruct them to, to think about doing while they, were, while they were definitely learning their lines as well. And the, the spirit of, of these um, kind of chorus pieces as well is that as the play, they start working on the play, everything up, to, up until then, the literacy-based activities and the drama-based activities were really done in a collective. Everyone was together, and this allows them to come back together. I just thought of something else I do with this. The other thing to have them look for is the verbs. Um, so you might just have a conversation with them about the first, the first little bit there, if we shadows have offended. First of all, what might a verb be? What is a verb? Does anyone know what a verb is? And then they would obviously tell you, well, it's an action word, Mrs. Bellabo. So we look for the action word in the sentence. And then I would have red pencil crayons and have them underline all the verbs they can find in their text that they're working on. And, I, and again, that would be something when they're working on line memorizing that they should be looking for verbs. Um, I'll just pause you there because yeah. that's, that marries that notion of, of actors. That's what you do as an actor. You're seeking the, the uh, what, what can you play? What is your intention? And the intention is usually driven <laughs> through the verbs. But it also brings back the pedagogical and the, the literacy that we talked about. Yeah. And then, and, and then with the verb, the verb is always the word, or often the word, that is, is emphasized with the voice. So we, we would then work on maybe exaggerating, emphasizing, if we shadows have offended, and play around with how much emphasis is necessary and let them sort of discover on their own what they think might be the right way to articulate a, um, either a sentence or a whole paragraph or whatever it might be. So. Good. So th that notion of bringing, bringing the plays to a close with the collective chorus is a, is a really crucial part because it's about all the, the pieces together. And, if, uh, and to encapsulate this, uh, this talk, I could have just talked on my own and, and made you all believe that it, uh, that, that it comes from one voice. But so, so to end, without, without having the participants and the people leading from the field doing the work, I can't really do my work without also having... Um, uh, students and colleagues who are working in this, bouncing off ideas on how to do this, it's difficult to make this work happen. And theater education, like all, like other areas, is really one that it's, it's, it's indeed collaborative. It's a collaborative learning process through it. And then, but to do something, you need, you need a team of people. And uh, so all that to say, thank you for, for coming to share some of this work with me. And also, I should acknowledge that SHRP was uh, funding uh, some of this project. Um,
and, and some of it actually was also a, a side piece also on, under Rita's shirk work as well that was looking at becoming pedagogical and, and it was indirectly and directly tied in as well with another shirk project. I should just say, these productions are usually done in June. So we have a whole year of, of working with their bodies, doing tableaus, working on voice, and then we discover the story, not till April. April May is kind of how it works. So April and May is when you would actually get the start reading it aloud. Yeah. 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 So a lot of body work, voice work beforehand, and then we start in just after March break. So, so Sue, the hot seat is here. So if you have if you have questions for the teacher or questions for for Graham and I as well, so we we can we'll we'll turn this into more of a conversation. So sort of opening up the floor. Uh, to, to questions or, or comments. So. Comments, yeah. Comments. I have a question. I'm so glad I was able to fight today because I'm going to And um, very exciting uh, on the level. Uh, I can go out to the dark for two days, mm -hmm. and I also have grandchildren. So, you know, I love the ground. And yes, this is very exciting because you're. I, I, this is, you haven't done any research, this is just, you know, and all that. The kids nowadays are ready for this. You know, my three-year-old granddaughter already knows the colors. They're teaching that again, and they're in the club, and she can talk to Ted. It's crazy, you know? So, this is what's needed. We have to upscale. We have to look at the times we're in. This is doing it, number one. Number two, uh, so that, uh, part, I love that you're uh, working with Shakespeare. Because I, you can see who I am, I've got all the other cultures, I love that, I love all the other, uh, great, it makes it richer, but let's not lose what we have. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you've chosen to use Shakespeare is fabulous, because it, it, we, why not keep that as a foundation, and that's what you're doing, you're using the foundation, so that's exciting to me also. Um, I'm glad you just added the last bit that you just did, because that was an important part for me to hear, that, um, that you feed in all of the, you know, the, the body, moving with the body, moving the boys, making them very comfortable with themselves before you actually get to the script. Because, you know, I, I hadn't heard that, I probably would have thought of that way of like, hmm, when did you actually do this? So that's wonderful. So it's, well, you can see it from that little bit you showed that the kids, um, what I saw, the kids have ownership. It's not like it's being done to them. They're doing, they're doing all that. And it's very neat. And on the oh gosh, so much fun. I love also the language. The way you're handling the language is that um, we're talking about being an educated citizen. That, that educated citizen. These kids now are going to have knowledge that they, I believe, cannot even be aware of that they have until something comes up where they're going to be speaking about something. And they're going to be, oh, I know. I got an email from a, a, a parent. The, one of the boys in that room is now at a different school, um, but I think it was even a few years after, he was watching Luke Skywalker and one, one of those Star Wars-y movies. And he, he was in The Much Ado About Nothing, and he said to his dad that uh, the relationship between Luke and, and uh, Princess Leia was interestingly similar to Beatrice and Benedict. <laughs> I just wanted to, to quickly add to that that uh, Shakespeare's been translated in over 80 languages, and in fact, in any given year, there are more Shakespearean um, translations in Japan than in, U in the UK. So Shakespeare is, belongs to the English language to a certain extent, but it has been become very transcultural and um, and it, it, it's not about, I mean, it's not about pro-Shakespeare, because we've, we've argued this many times, why Shakespeare, why not someone else? But, but a little bit of Shakespeare. But, but it is more, it is. It is, yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not, yeah. But I, 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 The complexity I, I, of the stories are, they get it, they can get it. Exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who had, uh, I know that Jessica had her hand up, and I believe that and so just another anecdotal example to add to what you were saying maybe 20, 20 minutes ago or something. I was doing a read aloud one-on-one -on -one with one of the students in my practicum for another class of ours. And in the book, um, the expression waxed and waned was used. And I, I stopped. This is a grade five student, I, ESL student. And I stopped her there. And I said, do you know what this expression means, what these two words mean? And she struggled 
um, it was waxed up first and then waned. She said, oh, well, last year when we did Shakespeare, I remember the line, how slow the old moon the new did wane. Oh, yeah. And I was, or it was two years previous, I think, that she had done that. And I was just very impressed. It wasn't even her line. Mm -hmm. So I think well, that speaks to the, the, the embodiment of the yeah. language that you're talking about. They all know each other's lines, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the repetition of the lines in terms of language learning, too. I was just curious about logistics when it came time to do these, this performance, this kind of big undertaking for the kids as well. If you did multiple performance evenings, just because I think that also, in terms of their experience, is sort of an interesting arc you go on if you do the same piece over and over again. We often do it for other classes. So I would give the teacher who's going to see our show the book, the Lois Burdett book, so that they would be front loaded with what's going to happen because it's the text the text is different than the than the book so they come in with all the Shakespeare language and a class of grade one two three sits there and goes and then they clap at the end um, but if you if the teacher has the opportunity to read the story beforehand then they're much more interested and engaged in what's going on so we do probably four different shows during the days that lead up to the production for the parents and I often do it in the afternoon we only do one show for the parents, um, but I haven't really actually considered doing more than one. Um, they always feel like it's such a letdown when it's over that another one, is, but, it's, but it's super draining on me. <laughs> so, so it's a balance, right? And there's usually about three productions per year in terms of at least three <coughs> teachers doing Shakespeare plays, so, and we've always thought about trying to do them like a little festival. festival because they happen independently, but all the kids see each other's plays. Yeah. And, but we're trying to formalize it a little bit more, but so much going on in elementary school that yeah. to Especially impose in mm -hmm. Jeffrey, and then uh, other questions or comments? I'm just wondering uh, how you actually implemented it. Like, I'm sure you're teaching other things as well, or do you just spend like an hour a day working on the plays, yeah, or is it, do you just focus that two months just mm -hmm. all on this? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Usually from after Mar after March break till when the story's finished, that's just an hour, and um, that includes the reading and possible liter literature responses to what's happening. the The time it gets, it's usually just an hour a day a until two weeks before the actual production for the parents, which for them is the pinnacle. Uh, then it becomes set. Because it's June, so all the library books have to be back in the library, and all of those things are taken care of, and you're, you're so, we're sort of in, how do I keep them busy mode? I don't know if we've been teaching yet, but in June, it's pretty, um, it's a great time to do it because it keeps them focused. And they want to come to school, and they've got all these things to do, and they can work on the set, and they can work on their, they, they also do a little bio for themselves for the program. And they, they're, they're writing newspaper articles or whatever it is they're doing. They're so focused on that 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 does, in the last two weeks, take over the entire day. As, as you're thinking about other, other thoughts, I think when, uh, when Normal mentioned the, uh, the, the, the inspiration, too, we had, uh, Sue and I, when we were in Prince Edward Island, we were part of a Shakespeare company out, out in the park, uh, Victoria Park. And our children were part of it, and other children were part of it. I think Sophie, our younger daughter, was only five, maybe four, and she was in a Midsummer Night's Dream. And, and just to see, I still remember her eyes and the other four or five-year-olds that were the fairies, and they were just, they were just taken by this magical world of Shakespeare. It could have been other plays as well, and I'm not saying other plays wouldn't do that, but there's a musicality to Shakespeare that, that, that young children hear, because there's a beat to it. There's also there's um, there's just the, the the fantastical characters appeal to to young learners as well. So we saw it in their eyes, and, and I, I think it was that made a decision to say, let's try this with younger children. Other questions or comments? Yes, I'm curious about how much you can share this well with other teachers that like at your school. You say a little bit, but out of your school and perhaps other districts. So how they yeah, how no, learn about we're, we, we keep talking about doing some pro -Ds for other districts, but uh, we, we went back into our school and invited the parents to come to a little performance of the research. Um, but no, we haven't, we haven't really had, aside from my colleagues who are doing it, um, there hasn't been too much out there. 
Really? How well, many teachers are involved? Well, there it ranges from year to year. This year there will probably be three of us doing Shakespeare. I guess every year it's roughly three. We're lucky four. <laughs> Do you have any connection with Bart on the Beach? They they have Shakespeare in the classroom too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if, if you overlap at all. Some of the students from my class have gone to the children's workshops that they do and sure. done done the summer the summer stuff and and love it. Yes. Um, but no, we're not directly. We haven't been been to see some of their things, but not uh, not directly related. Yeah, and the, the, a lot of those programs are outreach mm -hmm. programs, so they come in and and, and do the work, and it's it would be very complimentary. And this is a little more. Um, I guess a lot of the work that they do, they, they by building it into their own curriculum, it's a little different because we've had Catherine Ricketts and and other people come in and do some work, layer the work as well, and it's been quite helpful. So it's finding that finding that balance would be, would be more the one thing I find about doing it is it's such a, they're so complicated the stories it's not like the three little pigs where you can read it once and they've heard it before and they know it and you're done they it's a it's a delving deeper into one thing which was always something I struggled with when I when I was a younger teacher I. I felt like I was cutting the surface on a lot of stuff. And this, for me, is not cutting the surface <laughs> at all. It's way deeper. And, and the repetition of it is, it's, it's lovely to hear six-year-olds say things like, I don't know, um, can I join a <laughs> Um But that's not even a good Shakespeare line. But it really is nice to hear, hear, hear them be able to articulate the, that kind of language and get it. Part of the research, have you made any associations with Radio Media projects? Like you mentioned, Radio Media at certain point, and I'm curious about if you have made any associations with the work that you have done with the long-term project. With, with Radio, Radio Media? Oh, Radio Media. No, not directly, but I can see I can see some of the links in terms of a an infusion of the. the it's it's not other than it's part of it's it's. And uh, and the, the the only association there is that some of what sooner colleagues in terms of if they're on, if, when they're trying to honor the Montessori approach of, of materials and tactiles and taking care of um, and, and and really playing with the senses those are some of the indirect but nothing formally with the uh, Regio Emilia approaches but it, I think we it's always in the back of certainly my mind and our minds in terms of how how does this connect with Regio Amelia, which has been um, researched a fair amount. So if you know people that are interested in it. I'm doing my research. I'm doing my doctoral program on ADSD, educational studies, and I'm focusing on uh, teacher networks, like reflective thinking, uh, particularly using Regio Amelia uh, projects and Swedish projects. Mm -hmm. Swedish, Sweden and Regio Amelia have been very well connected in terms of doing this non project. So perhaps I will approach you. Sure. Really. Okay. Great. Other thoughts, or anyone who wants to jump into something Shakespearean as well? Good, well, thank you for coming and listening. Yeah. Thank you for spending your lunchtime here. And, uh, <laughs>